suppress it. Mm -hmm. Watch this again, looking through there. Yeah, a last minute uh, NASA headquarters all hands is going to delay some of the NASA, <coughs> NASA headquarters, uh, NASA leadership from uh, uh, arriving on time. They're gonna be here a little later. But I would like to welcome Admiral Brian Brown from the, the, the Commander of the Naval Meteorology and Oceanography Command. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, you know, uh, Ken uh, Newton from uh, NASA Shared Services Center. I'd like to add some doctor, and Dr. William Burnett, uh, Deputy Director of the uh, Naval Meteorology and Oceanography Command. Our, uh, our uh, guest speaker, Dr. Ed Hafer. Commanding officers and ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to the 23rd annual Holocaust Remembrance Program. Originally, this program was sponsored by the Navy, but it, for the last six years, it's been a cooperative effort between NASA, the Navy, and tenants here at, at Stennis. The, the Holocaust was an event that was primarily contemporaneous with World War II, but it was separate. The Nazi plans for extermination actually took precedence over their war efforts. The trains, personnel, and materials that were needed at the front were, were not allowed to be diverted to the war effort. During the period of November 7th, 1938 to April 8th, 1945, over 16 million men, women, and children were consumed by the fires of racial, ethnic, and religious hatred. The Holocaust was not just an atrocity affecting the Jews, but along with the six million or so Jews that were, were killed during the reign of terror, an additional 10 million people that did not fit in with the social reforms of Nazi Germany were killed or interned. These included the sick, the handicapped, the mentally ill, the gypsies, university staff, various Christian sects, communists, homosexuals, political prisoners, and prisoners of war. All the destruction was orchestrated by one man's <coughs> demonic vision, Adolf Hitler, Reichsführer of Nazi Germany. Now this year's national observance focuses on never again, heeding the warning signs. What were the warning signs that were overlooked? The world overlooked the Armenian massacres in World War I. Beginning in 1915, that's, about, that's almost 100 years ago, forgotten Holocaust that inspired Hitler. The killing of 1.5 million Armenian men, women, and children by the Ottoman Turks called the first modern genocide. For the Turks, it was an opportunity to clear the Turkish soil of Christian race. The atrocities they perpetrated were mass burnings, drownings, the use of poisons and drug overdoses such as morphine overdoses, toxic gas, and typhoid inoculations. They also did use deportations, death marches, and extermination camps. Sound familiar? Chillingly, Adolf Hitler used the Armenian massacre to justify the Nazi massacre of six million Jews, saying in 1939, <coughs> and I quote, who after all, speaks today of the annihilation of the Armenians. But the world has not overlooked Bosnia, Herzegovina, Rwanda, Nigeria, and the Sudan. Nor had it overlooked, the apartheid was abolished in the early 1990s by South Africa. <coughs> but yet, yet, the world's greatest ongoing atrocity goes unchecked. In today's handout, North Korea's labor and concentration camps are brought into the light. Forced labor camps comparable to the Nazi camps at Mauthausen and Buchenwald exist today in the darkness of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, where approximately 200,000 people are interred. And it's been reported that 400,000 people have died in these camps from torture, starvation, disease, and execution. Unlike the Nazi camps, these camps are solely designed for, as, uh, are, are primarily the, the foundation of North Korea's regime on, on a ter of domestic terror. Never again is not someone else's God. The famous statement by Pastor Martin Niemöller 
First they came for the communists, and I did not speak out because I was not a communist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. In 1980, a unanimous Congress established the United States Holocaust Memorial Council. In 1984, the Secretary of Defense encouraged the armed forces to observe the Holocaust. He reminded us that it was the military troops that first witnessed the evidence of the Holocaust as they liberated the camps. The, those in the armed forces, and we civilians who support them, must remember the dreams we stand for and the nightmares we stand against. The annual National, National Holocaust Memorial is held once a year on Yom HaShoah, the anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto. We hold this observance once a year. Many people ask, why do we still hold this observance? The Holocaust ended nearly 70 years ago. We hold this observance so that we can recognize and respond to the warning signs of genocide and act so it will happen never again. As a courtesy, as a courtesy of those around us, please make sure that your cell phones are turned off or silenced. I'd like to introduce Wendy Holiday from NASA to do the invocation. Wendy. A prayer for Yom HaShoah, composed by the Chief Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs of the United Hebrew Congregations of the Commonwealth. Today on Yom HaShoah, we remember the victims of the greatest crime of man against man, the young, the old, the innocent. A million and a half children, starved, shot, given lethal injections, gassed, burned, and turned to ash because they were deemed guilty of the crime of being different. We remember what happens when hate takes hold of the human heart and turns it to stone. What happens when victims cry for help and there is no one listening? What happens when humanity fails to recognize that those who are not in our image are nonetheless in God's image? We remember and pay tribute to the survivors who bore witness to what happened to the victims that, so that robbed of their lives, they would not be also robbed of their deaths. We remember and give thanks to the righteous of the nations who save lives, often at risk of their own, teaching us how in the darkest night we can light a candle of hope. Today on Yom HaShoah, we call on you, Almighty God, to help us hear your voice that says in every generation, do not murder. Do not stand idly by, by the blood of your neighbor. Do not oppress the stranger. We know that while we do not have the ability to change the past, we can change the future. We know that while we cannot bring the dead back to life, we can ensure their memory lives on and that their deaths were not in vain. So on this Yom HaShoah, we commit ourselves to one single act. Yisker, remember. May the souls of the victims be bound in the bond of everlasting life. We have a reading by Rena Perrin of NASA, Remember, by Fred Rothschild. Somewhere outside the fence, beyond where fierce dogs to crow, the earth turned in time as always, and the world did not take heed. And poison gas descended on those below, and the putrid smell of death rose and lingered over towers and towns and cities and universities of higher learning. Had love and logic been betrayed and courage swallowed by a void that man had become vile and so afraid as to strike willingly at the other? Or had hate unopposed flourished as people hid in shadows, clinging to the comfort of what was, afraid to challenge what was to come? The answers are what they are. For evil waits 
for hope to be forgotten, for people to accept despair. Ignorance does not deflect, nor learning protect against chaos and the darkness of the soul. So it is and will be. If we know, but refuse to remember. If we remember, but choose. Stennis, we have a choral group, The Voices of Stennis, directed by Stephen King. I'd like to introduce them. They're going to do a piece called Open Your Ears, O Faithful People, written by Willard F. Debush, Jab Debush, uh, and arranged by uh, Israel Goria. Uh, I'd like to introduce The Voices of Stennis. I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Edward Hafer from the University of Southern Mississippi in Hattiesburg. Dr. Hafer is an associate professor of music history at the university, holds a BA in music history and literature from Indiana University of Pennsylvania and, the, and a master's in music and PhD in historical musicology from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He has additional training at Millersville University, Pennsylvania, the Gott Institute in Dusseldorf and <coughs> Rothenburg ob Taubur in Germany. He has participated in a seminar on works on Richard Wagner at the University of Beirut. Uh, 
His research interests lie in music of the 19th century, music and painting, and music of the Holocaust, which is why we have him here today. He has presented and or published research on Wagner, Schubert, music, on music and painting, uh, music ped uh, pedagogy, ped and uh, cabaret performances at the concentration camps at Westerbork. During the summers, he leads a study abroad uh, course in Vienna, Austria, entitled Vienna City of Music. I'd like to welcome Dr. Haber. celebrates the unyielding survival instinct that we come together today to honor. I remember meeting my teacher one afternoon after he had a particularly difficult night. His wife was out of town and he was home alone. He had not slept well because a vivid <coughs> nightmare took him back to a different time and place. In the middle of the night, he thought he heard a blood-curdling scream, a scream the likes of which he had only heard once before in a camp during a war a half century removed. When he first heard the scream years ago, he got up from his tight bunk to investigate, only to find someone lying on the ground dead. He heard the last cry of a dying man. Since that unimaginable time, my teacher told me that he had channeled his energy into his work as a historian and musicologist. But he said something that has haunted me ever since. As a historian, it's not enough to look back. <coughs> Sometimes you have to feel back. So in this day of remembrance, as we hear stories of life and death and fear and hope, let us remember to feel back and to embrace the humanity of an age that seemed to need it most. Our story today takes place in early 1943 to June of 1944. During that period, Vester Bork in the Northeast Netherlands hosted one of the finest cabarets in Europe, <coughs> featuring prominent actors from the Berlin cabaret scene of the 20s and 30s, who were in exile after anti-Jewish legislation effectively banned them from the stage. Performances here were more than recreation. At Vester Bork, music and theater and art was a matter of life and death. It was a case of art in the quest for survival. So today I'd like to give you an overview of the cabarets at Vesterborg, discuss the privileged status of the artists, consider reactions of the fellow prisoners, and show how the productions were used to curry favor with the camp administration to avoid deportation to the Eastern death camps. As a way of introducing the subject, I would like to talk about two prominent figures, Billy Rosen and Max Ehrlich leaders of the cabaret and musical scene at Vesterbork. Billy Rosen lived from 1894 to 1944. He had an early career as a manufacturer. He was a frontline fighter in World War I, uh, fought in Russia where he was wounded. He gave his first concert as a musician uh, while he was convalescing. Uh, he formed the Capella Rosen where he played piano and he had a violinist and a cellist to perform with him. After the war, he went back to work in the factory, <coughs> and only gradually did he go into music. Eventually, he toured and performed all over Germany, all over Europe, and eventually, in 1924, he was engaged <coughs> to perform at the Cabaret de Comiker, the Cabaret of Comics in Berlin, where he stayed very successfully until the Nazis took power. As the Nazis seized power, we saw the times were changing, and the climate was becoming very scary to be a Jewish performer in town. 
on the first page of the handout that you have, we see a program <coughs> from this very same cabaret where Rosen performed. And this is, it was an introduction to the cabaret. It was published in three different languages. And I'd like to read you a fragment of this program just to give you a sense of the changing climate when the Nazis came to power. All the news that spread about atrocities and excess, excesses against Jewish citizens, Jewish enterprises, and Jewish artists are common lies from beginning to end. Wherever irrelevant encroachments of provocatory elements who have nothing to do with the great movement have taken place, the German government of the National Revolution has reestablished order with the utmost dispatch. The National Revolution in Germany has been made by men of integrity in the service of the great idea. Never has a deed of universal history been performed in such a pure and untarnished manner as the actions of the last few weeks in Germany. Perhaps many an individual fate may have to perish in the course of the general reconstruction of the empire and the consolidation of national ideals. Maybe that an important law of reconstruction may also affect the artistic manager or the cabaret or comiker. But all this will not obliterate the greatness of admiration for men and ideas that every nation, every profession, and every race ought to wish for as leaders and as aims. When in the following weeks we shall have the pleasure of welcoming in our house friends and artists from abroad, we hope that they will, guided by their own experience, become heralds and messengers in their own country, telling them at home of the greatness of the national rising the discipline and order of which excel all other events of the last century. Port Robichek. Well, as Rosen continued to perform and as the Nazis gained ever stronger hold, we see that many of the Jewish performers were banned from the stage. Eventually, Rosen was banished. He emigrated to Switzerland, Holland, Austria, and Czechoslovakia. By 1936, he went back to Berlin in hopes that maybe, just maybe, things weren't as bad as he remembered. But soon again after that, he was forced to flee, where he went to the Netherlands. When he was in the Netherlands, he met Max Ehrlich. Max Ehrlich was a performer that he had known from his Berlin days. <coughs> During his time working with Ehrlich, he learned a little bit about theater. He learned a little bit about music. Uh, he was a piano player, or Rosen was. Uh, he played piano, two piano duets with Eric Ziegler. Uh, eventually, his friends decided that maybe it was time for Rosen to go away. Maybe it was time for him to go to America where things might be safe. He got a visa. He got an affidavit from Cuba uh, to gain free passage to America. And he said to his friends, what should I do in America? There was nothing for him there, so he stayed. And by the time he made his way, or wanted to make his way to America by 1941, America was in the war, and they were no longer accepting immigrants. So Rosen was stuck. He was a performer. He was a lover of literature. He was a lover of Brooklyn symphonies. He played classical music with Ziegler. He read Thomas Mann and Proust in the original French. <coughs> but he made his living as a composer of hits, always with his signature, Text und Musik von mir, Text and Music by me. His recipe for a hit, he said he needed two comedians, one fat and one skinny, five pounds of sex appeal and a couple of catchy tunes, some old jokes and lots of new ones, three or four sets, red, green, and white lights, must look unrehearsed, so needs lots of rehearsing. <laughs> and above all, no politics. I'd like to play a song for you by Rosen. This is one of his hits. It's called Dork in Hawaii. There in Hawaii, I lost my heart. It's a love song. This is Rosen singing and very characteristic of the kind of music that he had performed before, uh, before going to Westerbork and in the camp itself. Ich reite dir um jeden 
Ehrlich, whom we see before you. Ehrlich was a prominent writer, actor, and director in Berlin during the 1920s. He appeared in over 40 movies. And when the Nazis came to power in 1933, they enacted a series of non-Aryan legislation, anti-Jewish legislation, uh, which essentially called for a boycott of Jewish businesses and services. And er Ehrlich was forced to flee. Like Billy Rosen, he had fled to various parts of Europe. He went to Austria, Switzerland, Holland, uh, back to Berlin for a while to perform for exclusively Jewish audiences at the Jewish Cultural League. Uh, to give you an idea of some of the skits that he would do, he had a scene in 1936 on a cabaret called Vorhang auf, The Curtain Goes Up. It was a review in 22 scenes that Ehrlich performed with Rosen. One of the scenes was a modern day interpretation of Shakespeare's Othello that includes such characters as Othello, a Moor, now a jazz singer, <coughs> by Ehrlich himself, Desdemona, his oh so faithful wife, Iago, a bitter ensign turned insurance agent, Cassio, a former lieutenant, now a pianist, Amelia, Othello's housemaid, and a certain Mr. Shakespeare who entered the scene. To give you an idea of the kind of performances that Ehrlich would perform, I want to play for you a song. A song that is not Ehrlich himself performing in this particular recording, but this is a song that uh, he actually, we know that he actually did perform in the Camp <coughs> Westerbork. The translation of this you have as example two on your handout. To tell of Herr Fröhlich and Herr Schön, Mr. Cheerful and Mr. Uh, handsome in a little dialogue. The one performer in this recording was actually one of the performers who worked with Ehrlich in Westerbork. <laughs> In the 
1730s, Max Ehrlich was at the top of his profession, but the events of Kristallnacht in November 1938 forced him to rejoin Willy Rosen in exile. Many Germans fled to the Netherlands, and the Dutch government had to open the camp Vesterbork in 1939 to house the German refugees. On July 1st, 1942, the Germans seized control of the camp, spelling disaster for 107,000 of the nearly 140,000 Jews residing in the Netherlands who had passed through the camp over the next three years. Presiding over the camp was Albert Conrad Gemmicker, an insurance agent turned policeman who was elevated to Obersturmführer in 1940. Gemmicker was an icy bureaucrat who valued order above all else. And he was in charge of the weekly transports, the orders that came from The Hague saying, the train will roll in and we need to have 800, 900, 1,000 members, whatever the number was for the week. We need that many people loaded up and sent to the east. Who was on that train didn't really matter as long as it was full. And the duties of the weekly transport were handled by the German Jews who were in charge of camp administration. But according to survivor Jakob Boas, quote, Anyone who in whatever manner offended the commandant personally would be put on the list. It happened to the gardener who failed to doff his cap to him and to the parent whose child broke a window. It happened to the young woman he, whom he overheard impugn Germany and to the 50 inmates of one barrack who were seized because a boy in blue pajamas hid himself in a tent in order to escape the train. But as long as he could feel the weekly deportation orders, the commandant was free to concentrate on more entertainment, entertaining things, like the weekly cabarets. Between July 1943 and June 1944, the performers at Vesterbork mounted a series of six full-scale productions. In May 1943, a transport arrived with Max Ehrlich, Billy Rosen, actress Camilla Spira, and singer violinist Yeti Kantor, and these professional performers formed the core of the camp theater group. Under Ehrlich's direction, the first Gunter Abend, the first variety show, was performed, and the program of this is example three in your handout. This first variety show consisted of 10 numbers, comic sketches, songs, dances, and music for two pianos played by Billy Rosen, and Eric Ziegler. In all, six performers, all professional artists, were included in this production, plus a lighting director and a stage manager. The numbers were drawn largely from their existing performing repertoire. Such a success was this first production that the performers were given great freedom and resources for future productions. Soon the reviews grew in scope to as many as 19 numbers, many newly composed in the camp. Productions included musicians, actors, carpenters, painters, tailors, wig makers, costume designers, barbers, and other craftsmen. They even had amateur ballets and choruses. The more people they could involve, the more likely they would be to be safe from the weekly deportation. The review Bravo de Capo from October 1943 employed over 50 actors, musicians, and crew members, including my own teacher. The need to seek protection from deportation became even more apparent when on the eve of that October production, Hitler declared Western Europe to be duden frei, free of the Jews, and that Vesterbork would soon be evacuated. Amidst this backdrop, a survivor's report captures the relative importance of the cabaret in Vesterbork's daily activities. Quote, at the end of the fourth year of the war, when all goods were scarce and millions of people could get no clothing, when in Germany the populations of whole cities lost all their belongings, when in Poland and in other concentration camps millions of men suffered and died, in this camp, everything needed was available in order to have a metropolitan show. 
Buyers got permission to travel through the whole country and brought home the best cloth for the costumes or huge rolls of heavy velvet for the stage curtain. The stage itself was enlarged, the most modern theater illumination installed. The workmen had to work night and day to get ready as quickly as possible. The artists were free from all other work and of course were not put on transports. They could rehearse the whole day in some of the little flats, the inhabitants of which had to return to one of the human storehouses, as the large barracks were called. When the first night took place, everybody was fascinated. The prominents had done their best to recall their bygone days of their great successes. The dialogue was brilliant, the dancing girl beautiful, and the decorations marvelous. The commander was content and happy. Now he could entertain his guests with one of the best shows in Europe, and the costs were paid by the Dutch people. He attended every performance. One evening, he ordered the artist to perform a special program for him after midnight. They could produce whatever they liked. The head of, the sever the head of several services and their wives had to make up the audience. You see, no assignees. Such a first night, of course, was the social event of Vestervoort. Nobody who saw so many well-dressed and well-painted women would believe that these were the inhabitants of a camp in a German-occupied country. Surely this forces an unbelievable contrast to the weekly misery of the transports. This unbelievable contrast made all the more, was made all the more troubling by Gemmicker's scheduling of the cabarets on Tuesday evenings, hours after the cattle cars roared to the eastern death camps. Gemmicker once told Ehrlich, I should never ask you to play the evening before a transport, but the evening after it will be good. It turns the minds to other things. In some cases, it turned the minds to resentment. Some of the prisoners resented the treatment of the performers some <coughs> apparent lack of respect for the gravity of the transports. Eddie Hillism, who was one of the prisoners, referred to Ehrlich and Ziegler as Hofnarren, the court jesters, and a journalist, Philip Mechanicus, who was interned in the camp, once wrote that there was something loathsome going on in the background when every transport leaves. This time, while the transport was being got ready and was moving off, People were dancing, actually dancing. Rehearsals had been going on for some time for a review, as if Vesterborg itself was not rather like a theatrical show. Indeed, it was precisely the awareness of the looming transports that kept the performers focused on their craft. The very stage on which they were performed, on which they performed was made from board salvaged from the burnt synagogue from the neighboring Asen, the town right next door. It was a symbolic reminder of the tenuousness of their position. As the leader of the troop, Ehrlich deliberately sought ways to endear the group to Gemmicker, and Gemmicker in return rewarded his favorite stars with private housing, freedom from certain duties, and post-performance gatherings or he would share drinks and cigars with those whose talents brought him prestige in the eyes of the SS officials in The Hague. Their oddly symbiotic relationship was based on a mutual respect that afforded Ehrlich a bit of artistic license to poke light fun at the conditions in the camp. In September 1943, the performers presented Gemmicker with a picture book to thank him for supporting the reviews. The book now housed at Yad Vashem in Jerusalem contains 41 images and caricatures from the review Humor and Melody, including this image, which seemingly could only be offered to a camp leader with whom one had built a solid rapport. The text reads, when one is one up to one's neck in dreck, he has nothing to chirp about. I chirp anyway. Dedicated to Herr Obersturmführer Gemmicker on September 27, 43, with all good wishes, signed Max Ehrlich, 
Billy Rosa, and Eric Ziegler. A more formal thank you appears on another page depicting Max Ehrlich speaking directly to Gemmiger as he sits in his armchair in the first row of the performance hall where he sat every night. The caption says, and I thank Herr Commandant for making this evening possible. The reviews themselves also took aim at the conditions and feelings facing the fellow prisoners. Nestled between playful skits, love songs, instrumental numbers, and dances were numbers that captured the spirit of daily life. Humor and melody, for example, begins with Appel, Appel, an ensemble about the morning roll call where the prisoners were summoned before their captors. The text of this number, roll call, roll call, whether dark or light, when the signal sounds, one, one must get into position. One rises from his little bed and then begins the plan of the day. Wash first your face and don't forget your teeth. Then a little hairdressing and manicuring the nails. Then one gets into warm, fine wool underwear. And finally, in all cases, into one's nice overalls. Roll call, roll call. When the signal sounds, one must get into position. Other numbers, another picture of that particular number. Other numbers refer to the joy of receiving packages, to the amorous relationship between different members of different service groups, and a melancholy reminder that they should enjoy life while they could. This particular image is the scene for the musical number I will play shortly. Uh, post kuchin uh, basically the olden days, the times of the old uh, post carriage. And underneath you see written, immer langsam, immer langsam. Take it easy, take it easy. We'll revisit this image at the very end of the talk. In spite of the fear and tragedy that pervaded the camp, Gemmiker took pride in the conditions and administration of Westerbork, so much so that he commanded Rudolf Breslauer to produce a film on the camp activities. This is the only such film that was not authorized by higher Nazi officials. Example four of your handout contains the draft outline of a four minute scene devoted to this review. The scenes are derived from productions of Munter Abend, uh, variety shows that were performed in March and April of 1944. The, the particular programs for these events are the last two pages of your handout. So if you take the last two pages and kind of fold them in half, you see the programs that would have been passed out to the performers in these productions from 43 and 44 passed out every night and collected at the end just to save on the paper. But as you see on example four, the column on the left contains the stage directions and the column on the right contains texts that were to be interspersed between the scenes. This clip offers a narrow window into the level and quality of the productions. <coughs> One can observe the grandeur of the staging and costuming and well imagined the precision of the performers, all attributes that made them a valuable commodity to camp leadership and kept the actors from the Tuesday morning transports until the very end. <coughs> There's Billy Rosen and Eric Siegler in the two piano duets conducting the orchestra at Vesterborg. <coughs> out to introduce and ask if we're enjoying the program. <coughs> Some of the performers engaged in a little skit. You can see the curtain, you can see the costumes, and realize that this is in a transit camp in the middle of nowhere in northeast Netherlands. This is here. 
here, for the, here, sure, the tune that you heard, you see Mox Ehrlich on the right. So you heard the tune that actually goes with this as the two are dancing around, engaging in their little song. Contour, who was a violinist, um, a singer, she was a radio performer during the time. This is Esther Phillips, <coughs> one of the dancers. Sent to Auschwitz when she was 29. <coughs> the dancer again. This is the scene where she comes out and she is making her big debut. This is her becoming an actress. And as an actress, she's enamored with the theater and she's intrigued by getting her big break. And that dance is all well and good, but she has greater ambitions. She wants to be the big star. And all big stars have constantly changing a little. in another scene. And this is the scene that they tell us is the, the sketch uh, Tame Beasts, a totally wild thing, recipes for taming unruly wines. Don't try this at home either. <laughs> and this is the musical finale, A Kid Is Born. At the pianos, the happy parents, Billy Rosen and Eric Ziegler. Two grand pianos, velvet curtains, great costumes. And that is the clip dedicated to the cabaret performances. By summer 1944, the Allies were closing in and Germany increased its efforts to liquidate the camp. The final transported Theresienstadt left in September 1944 and included Max Ehrlich, Willy Rosen, and nearly all of the review participants, most of whom were later set, sent to Auschwitz for execution. Eric Siegler was one of the few survivors. There's a story of Max Ehrlich going to Auschwitz, and as he was in line, he was so famous that one of the guards recognized him and they pulled him out of line <coughs> to tell jokes and be entertained until it was his turn to be executed. The literature on artistic activities and concentration camps often discusses the concept of spiritual resistance, where art is considered an intangible emotional comfort that sees people through the horrors of their situation. That was undoubtedly the case with the cabarets at Vesterbork. But more than just an artistic outlet, the performers realized that their art was literally the key to any hope they had of survival. Their concerted effort to grow the productions for the sake of protecting their fellow prisoners represented a calculated act that almost succeeded in winning back their lives. But by the end, not even Gemmaker's watchful eye could prevent their tragic fate. I'd like to end with a final number, the translation of which is example five in your handout. 
Uh, the text is very idiomatic German that doesn't really translate well. So what you have in example five is kind of a sense of the gist of the text. Kind of what it means, but it's not a word-for-word -word translation. The performer here is Louis Devise. Louis Devise was a member of this cabaret in 43. Uh, Louis Devise went to Auschwitz and was later actually escaped from Auschwitz and survived. He just died several years ago, but this was a song for in Westerbork, if we go back to our scene. I'm sorry, went the wrong way. This was the scene, this is the background that accompanied this song, the Immer Nang song, Take It Easy, Take It Easy. And this is, I think, a nice summary of sort of their ex collective experiences. So this is Louis Devise singing Immer Lang Zang. and I found the transit reports from uh, when he was sent out and he was on one of the trains that went to Bergen-Belsen. Uh, had he gone the week before or the week after, he would have ended up at Auschwitz. So, total luck. So how many survived from this group that performed over there? Of the performing Six group, eight. not very many. Uh, Louis Devise got out, my teacher got out, um, Eric Siegler, but not many. As we said, 107,000 out of the 140,000 Jews came through here from the Netherlands, came through this camp uh, on route, en route to other places. And I think maybe only 5,000 of them survived from the Netherlands. Primary source materials are very impressive. How is this preserved, and more importantly, how is it historically discovered? Uh, there is an archive at the camp. There's a little remembrance center there. There is a big collection of documents at the Netherlands Institute for War Documentation in Amsterdam. Uh, luckily, when I was there a couple of summers ago, they got just about everything scanned. So you don't have to leave with a stack of papers. You can leave with your little hard drive uh, with thousands of pages of documents. Uh, this, the movie that you saw, um, we don't know a lot about that. That was sort of an unusual scene. And we're not sure why it was put together uh, in terms of, we know that Gemmiger called for it himself. That did not come from higher Nazi command. Maybe he saw the writing on the wall towards the end and thought that if things go to trial, this document can show the good side, maybe it would be a mitigating factor. We don't know. I mean, that is pure speculation as to why he would do this. Uh, but. Some of the documentation does come out with individual survivors, the collection of the camp documents. Uh, Yeti Contour, the one that you saw playing the violin and singing, she left uh, her archive to the Netherlands Theater Library.
and that is available for review and it has a lot of scripts. It has a lot of, there's a opera libretto there with markings all, on, all over it that was scheduled to be performed in June of 44. So, and they're very precise. You have Ehrlich's handwriting down to this number will take two minutes, this will take four minutes. They were very precise in everything that they did. So we are very lucky to have quite a lot of documentary evidence <coughs> of some of these activities. trial, I'm not sure, I, I've not found evidence of what became of him, but I don't think he was in prison for very long. Other questions? The, the camp today, if I can just show you, th that is an image of the barracks. This is a reconstruction as it now exists in their museum today. You see the bunk stack three high. Um, that would have been a latrine, what remains of it. That was the great hall where these productions were performed. That was as it stood in the day. Nowadays, that's all that remains. You can see one of the monuments at this camp is something called the final roll call. This was Louis Devise, who you just heard singing, was very instrumental here. The dark part of the tile here is an outline of the Netherlands. What you see here, one stone at the final roll call, one stone for everybody who was pat who passed through that camp. You see the, the stars of David for the Jews. Occasionally you see a little flame to capture the Roman and the Sinti, the gypsy populations that went through. There is this tribute to the victims. 56,500 Jews from the Netherlands were murdered in Auschwitz and 200 Sinti and Roman. In Mauthausen, 1749, Netherlandish Jews were murdered. 175 in Theresienstadt and 3,000 that went from Theresienstadt to Auschwitz. In Bergen-Belsen, 1,700 were deported. Sobibor, 34,295 were murdered. This, what you see here is the path where the train used to come in. It was called the Boulevard of Misery. The tracks had been taken out and turned up at the end as a final monument. And at the Remembrance Center, you have this frozen tear to capture the essence of this time. Yes? Uh, at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., one of the things that is remembered is that uh, the end of the war didn't necessarily bring freedom. Uh, there, were, there were a large number of pogroms that continued, for example, in Poland. Oh, yes. Um, And there was a lot more of that than anyone would expect. Just because uh, the war was over does not mean the conflict or the struggle or the suffering or the misery um, was over. And in many ways it lives on in those who were still with us who had to experience this. This is something that never goes away. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank all of you for participating today. It's always, it's always nice to see a group that takes time out uh, for especially such a, an occasion as this as we, were, we uh, do the Holocaust Days of Remembrance. Of course, the focus on this is the Holocaust, uh, but it, as Steve mentioned at the very beginning, it's a reminder to all of us to look back towards history and look at the events that took place in the, in the leading uh, time towards the Holocaust and then remember that these kind of things still exist today. Steve mentioned a bunch of places in Africa. We can't forget Cambodia. We can't forget Bosnia-Herzegovina. And you know, as we approach even today, uh, monitoring what's going on in Syria, which is a potential for these kind of uh, events uh, going on today, it's all around us. It's a constant reminder. So I'm glad that you guys took the time. And don't forget the Holocaust of over 53 million here in the United States, which is called War on the Unborn. So I want, to, I want to thank everybody for being here. Thank you for coming. Um, I, I also need to thank uh, the Stennis Diversity Council. Um, I've been participating. I think this is my sixth uh, Holocaust uh, uh, 
days of remembrance since I've been associated down here in, in the Stennis area. And, uh, and it, uh, it is really one of the, the best put on uh, events that we have here. So thank you, uh, Stennis Diversity Council. And I can't, I need to single out a, a man here that does this every year. He's been doing it for a long time. We, I think last year, the year before, we celebrated some 20th, it was your 20th year, or we gave you a plaque on that day, but. This but is 23. This is 23 for Steve, so how about a big round of and, and I'd be remiss to not uh, thank the voices of Stennis. Um, I saw your fearless leader run out, but uh, uh, excellent, excellent rendition today. And a little shout out to Teresa on her solo. Uh, not easy to do a Hebrew section of, uh, of music, and I thought you did an outstanding job. It was very nicely done. So experience uh, as we go back into history to remember the Holocaust um, I will admit that this is this is a unique day uh, in my life experience uh, around the Holocaust I've been to the, the National uh, uh, Holocaust uh, Memorial Museum um, and I've, I've participated in other in other things but this is the first time I've, I've really experienced this aspect of the Holocaust in terms of art and um, it is really a testament, I think. Uh, you know, you, you think of the Holocaust, it's, it's the absolute corruption of, of man's free will. It's the, the free will turning to evil. It's, it's the corruption of politics and power and, and what, what society can let happen if they're not mindful and, and people don't step up. But what's, what's, I think, truly remarkable about this story is that part of man's free will, the part that's free to love, the part that's free to express themselves, they didn't let themselves be beat down in this situation. It's a resistance, it was a survival instinct, but um, I'm a little ashamed that we don't have more of this. I didn't see this part when I went through the, the memorial up in Washington, uh, Washington D.C. I don't remember seeing this as a highlight. And I think it's something um, that we all should, should remember. Um, I'm, a, I'm an amateur musician uh, in, uh, by trade outside of, uh, outside of the work here. Um, I, know what, I know what that, piece of art can do and how it can transform you. And so while I was listening to the story, I was feeling it as well. So I feel a little verklempt because it, I get a little emotional when I talk about some of these things. But I thank you for sharing that part of the story because I think for most of us, has anybody ever heard this story before? Or in, well, that's good, there's a few. Or experienced the art. I mean, I've seen some of the art of the Holocaust and things, um, but this was a really unique one for, for us. So I thank you for coming and sharing it with us today. If you could come up here. we. I have a small token of appreciation. It's actually not that small. <laughs> Step out here so we can get the focus. But uh, uh, this is presented to you for the Holocaust Days of Remembrance uh, to, to uh, uh, commemorate today and your, your uh, participation with us. And as a, as a reminder uh, that we're down here and you're welcome back at any time to come and, and you share with us. Thank you. George, your camera's not as fast. <laughs> George got camera, camera and behind. 
I'll see you next time. Thank you.